Welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. In every episode, I interview someone who's changed, recovered, or become successful after having faced real adversity in their life. On today's episode is Jeffrey Deskovic, who spent 16 years in prison in the US after being wrongfully convicted of rape and murder at the age of just 17. Jeffrey was coerced into giving a false confession by police and DNA evidence found prior to his trial even suggested that they had the wrong person. But unbelievably, the police and prosecution continued with the case and Jeffrey was ultimately convicted of the crimes. Thankfully, the Innocence Project finally took on Jeffrey's case and tested the DNA evidence that was found pre-trial against the police data bank, which found the real perpetrator of the crime and Jeffrey was subsequently released. After receiving millions in compensation, Jeffrey has studied to become a lawyer himself and has even started the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation, which has already helped to overturn various other wrongful convictions. So, without further ado, let's find out what happened by listening to his story from start to finish. Jeff, the same way I do with all of my guests, I like to go back to somewhere near the start of their story. And so I'd like to rewind, if possible, back to 1989. You're, you're 16 years old and you're living in a relatively small town when a classmate of yours tragically uh, is found having been raped and, and murdered. Could you tell us a bit about the events which led up to you being wrongfully arrested and charged with that crime in, in the beginning? Sure, sure. So, um, uh, so I grew up in Peekskill, New York, which is on the suburbs. A uh, population of approximately twenty-five thousand people. It was uh, middle class. It was uh, ethnically diverse. Um, you know, after school, I was, um, I was like, you know, I guess you could say I was kind of like the life of the party. It was me and one other kid, and then there was a lot of people I used to play in, uh, in, in the apartment complex and nearby areas, and. Pretty much whatever I would suggest would be what we would do. If we're going to play stickball, we're going to go swimming, we're going to play Monopoly, we're going to go for a bike ride or any other type of sports. But uh, in school, in, in high school itself was, was a different story. So the kids were like one or two years older than me because when I was um, in grade school, I had skipped the grade. So the kids were like older than me. So I didn't, I didn't quite fit in there. And so I was like quiet. I was to myself. And you know, I didn't play very many organized sports. And in the course of the police, police investigation, they interviewed a lot of students from the school, and some of them told the police that they might want to speak with me because I didn't fit in. So this is how it came on the police radar. They also said that um, that they felt that um, uh, my emotional reaction was disproportionate to what my actual relationship with the victim was, which was she was a classmate and two of my classes as a freshman, um, one as a sophomore. Uh, I knew her name, she knew mine. That was really the uh, the extent of it. We weren't even really on a high vibe basis. Um, so um, the in addition, the Peak Skill Police, they got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which uh, claimed purported to have the psychological characteristics of what the actual perpetrator would be like. And I had the misfortune of matching that profile. So it was like a type of reinforcing factor. How shocking is it when you are 16 years old and your classmate, you know, has been raped and murdered? Because they say your reaction to it was disproportionate. But I mean, how, how do they expect a 16 year old to be? That's an extremely shocking thing that nobody should should have to go through. So do you remember how you felt in that time before the investigation kind of started with them being interested in you? Yeah, I, I would say it's fair to say I was distraught. But then again, I mean, it wasn't all that different from the rest of the people in, in, in the city. I mean, consider that they offered free mental health counseling to anybody who uh, who asked for it. So, uh, you know, in that aspect of it, it wasn't all that different. And, you know, that was really my first brush with death. And I was someone who was sensitive. And, you know, that, that was why I reacted emotionally. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they take an interest in you because you had the misfortune of matching this this profile that you mentioned before. And, and how did things play out from there? So they played this cat and mouse game with me for about six weeks where uh, my interactions with them always took on the following dynamic that half the time they would speak to me as if I was a suspect and the other half the time they would pretend like they needed my help to solve the crime. So when they would push too hard on the Jeff as a suspect and I would become frightened and want to get away from them, that's when they would uh, 
knocked me off balance by, you know, Jeff is this junior detective helper uh, team. Uh, before I was a teenager, um, when I, when a preteen years, the career I wanted to have when I grew up was to be a cop. So right. I direct intersected with that. And then also, uh, you know, they did the good cop, bad cop routine. And, uh, you know, my father was never involved in my life in any, in any way, uh, I never saw him. So the, I began to look at the officer who had been pretending to be my friend as a, uh, as a father figure. Wow. And Jeff, so you mentioned that your father wasn't in, in your life there, but was, was your mum around? Because one thing that I thought when I was, you know, when I was listening to your story um, and reading about it in, in other places is when they started treating you as a suspect, even though it was half the time, was, was that something that you shared with, you know, an adult that cared about you that, that might have raised the alarm, so to speak, and might have advised you to be careful with them or got legal representation? Was there anybody older than you that, that you can Invited in and told about what was going on during those six weeks. No, I mean my no. I mean I lived with my mother and my grandmother. Uh, I mean I did share with my mother that after the first time, and and um, you know she told me that she didn't want me to speak to uh, to to the police. But the rest of the interactions with them, you know, I didn't say anything. Uh, I didn't say anything, you know, to her. You know, I mean, I was uh, I was 16, and that's the age where you know kids start to push back some against the uh, you know their, their parents, and they try to get their, you know more autonomy and independence. And you know, we know better than our parents. And in that respect, I wasn't all that different from from other people. Uh, the police knew that my mother didn't want me to talk with them, but they you know they didn't they didn't keep her informed either. I'm sure this is where the the good cop side of it works very well because you had the you know the the dream of sort of becoming a, a police officer when when you got older and then all of a sudden there's this officer filling in the father figure role and uh, you know as you said yourself you you were playing almost a junior detective role how how do you feel when they're doing that to you does that is that building the trust and connection with them so they're planting the seed there ready for to get you to to do what they want essentially yeah and that's exactly that's exactly right you know and they're making me the center of attention and they're making me feel important and uh you know they're saying things like stop in from time to time and and uh, they were asking me uh they ask me opinion questions and they congratulate me that my opinion is uh correct and you know, and they're sharing pizza with me and, you know, all these kind of things, you know, they're, they're really, essentially they're overreaching me is what, is what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that, well, one, I found many aspects of the story extremely saddening and, and shocking, but one incident particularly, which I'm sure you remember very well, is when is the polygraph. Um, and I'll let you explain that in, in detail, but yeah, if you could just tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yes. So, uh, periodically during the six weeks, they would tell they would tell me that they wanted me to take a polygraph test, and I always um, declined. Uh, but at the end, they told me that you know they had some new information that had come into the file, and they wanted to share that with me, and that would allow me to be even more helpful to them. But first, I would have to take and pass the uh, polygraph. You know, and plus they also told me that when, once I passed the polygraph, then that portion of our conversations where they would start talking to me like a suspect, we could be uh, finished with that. Yeah. Right. So the next day, rather than report to the high school, uh, I instead went to the police station for the polygraph. Uh, my mother thought I was in school, so she had no idea what was going on. So she didn't call around looking for me. And uh, they drove me from Higgskill Police Headquarters. They drove me from there to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County. So it was about 40 minutes away by car. Um, so I wasn't able to leave anymore. I had no idea where I was. Uh, you know, there was three cops that came there with me uh, from Peekskill. Uh, they put me in the car specifically with the officer who pretended to be my friend. The other two followed in a different vehicle so he could continue on with his rapport building. Right. And uh, eventually we got to the office where this polygraph was uh, taking place at. And the polygrapher was a um, Putnam County Sheriff's investigator, but he was dressed like a civilian and he never identified himself as, as a cop. So I never knew that he was a police officer. He never read me my rights. Uh, he gave me a four page brochure on how the polygraph worked, but it had a lot of big words in it that I didn't understand. But then I figured, well, you know, what does it matter? I'm here to help the police. Let's just get on with it. So from there, they put me in a small room and he, 
gave me countless cups of coffee to get me nervous. Uh, and then he attaches me to this machine and then he uh, launches into his third degree tactic. So he uh, raises his voice at me, he invades my personal space. You know, he kept asking me the same questions over and over again. And, and uh, you know, as each hour goes past, my fear is, you know, increasing in proportion to the time. And he kept that up for uh, six and a half to seven hours. Wow. And didn't also the, the the police officer that was pretending to be your friend, if if, if you like, came in and said, look, like I'm holding them off. Um, yes, exactly. but I can't, yes. But I can't keep doing it for much longer. So obviously then you're thinking, what does that mean? Does that mean they're going to harm me? And and he was saying, well, if you, if you say what we want you to say effectively, then it will all be over and you can go home. And once, you know, you put that on top of all the other things you mentioned, like plying you with coffee, invading your personal space, you know, being, being aggressive. I think, you know, any 16 year old is going to say what they want to say in, in, in that situation. Could you tell us a bit about what was going through your mind at that stage as you became more frightened and these tactics were being used against you? Yeah, I was becoming more frightened. And, you know, just for context, you know, I wasn't used to talking to adult males. I, you know, because again, my father wasn't involved in my life and had minimal interaction with my, with my uncle. So, um, so finally, he reaches the point where he says, uh, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the test result that you that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. And it was at that moment that the officer who had been pretending to be my friend. That's when he came in the room. And as you said, he told me, look, I, I've been holding them off. I'm harming you. I can't do this any longer. You have to help yourself. Look, just tell them what they want to hear. And you can go home afterwards. Uh, you're not going to be arrested. You know, being young, naive, frightened, uh, 16 years old, not thinking about the long term. I was, you know, I was in fear of my life. The fact that I didn't know where any, any, where I was and no one else knew where I was either was very large in my mind, you know. And um, there's this threat, there's this false life preserver. And, you know, I, I took that out that he, that he offered it, it to me. And this, it all, this came down to my just needing to believe in this false promise that I wasn't going to be arrested. And so I, made up a story based on the information which they had given me in the course of the interrogation that day and the six weeks run up to it. Uh, by the time it was all said and done, I had collapsed uh, into a, a fetal position. I was um, crying uncontrollably. Uh, yeah, I was arrested. Wow. And the thing is, is before listening to your story, uh, Jeff, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have really understood false um, confessions that well at all. They'd think, well, if I didn't do something, I would never, I would never, con I would never confess to something that I didn't do, you know, especially of this, this severity. But you there at the age of 16 being, you know, in intimidated, plied with coffee, them shouting in your face, basically telling you that, you know, you were going to come to harm. That is that is incredibly understandable, especially because one of the officers officers had presented himself as a figure of trust and offered you a way out and effectively promised that that would be it if you just did what he asked. So you did. And that's understandable. But this also happens with adults as well. And yes. um, you you having studied studied law now, which we'll get into more detail uh, later, but could you talk to us a bit about why why adults also give false confessions? If we could just touch on that for a bit before before moving on with, with your story. Yeah, well, I think also, I mean, you know, fear, uh, threats, uh, you know, being run down, you know, often interrogation tactics, you know, food deprivation and length of, length of interrogation and being cut off from from uh, moral support. Um, just the, the one of the interrogation tactics is, you know, take innocence off the table. So that means don't even allow somebody to make an innocent. You think they're about to issue a denial, just, just jump in and cut them off or, you know, continue on with the interrogation, pretend like you didn't hear what what was just said. So, you know, it, it imply the complete futility of maintaining uh, innocence or even um, pretending to have evidence that that doesn't exist. I mean, that's another tactic that that, uh, that that's done. Right. OK. Yeah. The mind is a powerful thing, isn't it? But it can also be our worst enemy in a way because we're susceptible to tactics like this. And people were listening, thinking, well, you know, I, I wouldn't be or, or whatever else. But if you find yourself in that situation. Totally different story then. And just for context, to build off your point, you know, wrongful convictions that are caused by coerced false confessions have been, you know, that that's 25 percent of the, of the DNA proven exonerations. 
Wow. Wow. So this is this is something that that does happen very often. So, yeah, shocking. And sadly, you had to you had to experience that. So you give this false confession after, you know, seven hours of of intimidation and, and all the rest of it. And so from there, was it straight to jail where they they hold you until your trial was going to take place? How did things play out from there? And how were you feeling, I guess, heading into into prison for the first time? You must have been terrified. Yeah. So from there, I mean, they drove me to the police headquarters. You know, they, they I still didn't realize at that point that I had been arrested. I mean, they, they put me in handcuffs and I asked, well, why, why are you putting me in handcuffs? You, you told me you weren't going to arrest me. And the lieutenant who oversaw everything just simply said, uh, safety is what he said. It didn't really make any sense to me, but, you know, they were the adults and I wasn't running the show. So uh, they drove me to the uh, police station and uh, they gave me pizza and I was, you know, eating that. And, you know, the cop would have been pretending to be my friend. He, he disappeared. And while I was at the police headquarters, I mean, I was periodically interrupted by different officers carrying out different aspects of the processing. And I remember finally when they took the, uh, you know, got the hand, got the uh, fingerprints, you know, put the uh, fingers in the ink and do the fingerprints. And I remember that really aggravated me. And, you know, so I turned to this other cop that the one who had been the bad, the bad, played the bad cop role. And I said, you know, what is he doing? I'm over here trying to eat pizza. I've got, I've got ink all over my fingers now. And he said, yo, he has the right to do that. And I said, well, what, what do you mean he's got the right to do that? Uh, he was told I wasn't going to be arrested. And he said, oh, 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 you are being charged with the crime. And it was at that moment that I realized really what had happened. How are you feeling in that moment when, when the realization finally hits you? I was feeling angry. I was feeling betrayed. I, I was feeling uh, uh, frightened. I was feeling embarrassed. You know, I, I mean, the first thing in terms of the embarrassment, the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, like my mother told me not to talk to talk to you guys. And, you know, I, I knew better. And look at how it's all turned out. And, you know, I thought about, you know, what would my reputation be? I'm sure this is going to be, a, a, you know, a, a news item. And so, you know, I'm thinking about that as well. And uh, they drove me to from the police station to the, the, county, the county jail. And I just remember being very... Uh, I remember being frightened and really just being terrified at the, in, in the county jail. I had never been to jail before for anything. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't imagine how scary that mu that must have been. What What were your first experiences of that county jail like? Yeah, it uh, it they well, first thing is you know they, they they did a strip search and so that was a humiliating thing that I was totally not not used to. And then they they put me in the uh, the bullpen area, you know, which is like a housing area where they have a bunch of prisoners at before they assign you to a particular cell. And, you know, there was a lot of other prisoners there. You know, they were all they were all adults. And, um, you know, I was I was I was afraid, frankly. I mean, I'm 16 years old. I'm around a bunch of uh, adults. And, you know, they're asking me, you know, do I have cigarettes on me or, you know, do I have any kind of drugs on me that the, the police had somehow not, the, the correctional officers somehow didn't find, and I don't have no way of satisfying them on, on, on that front. So, you know, I was, uh, I, I was, I was frightened. And, and how long was it before your, your trial happened? That happened almost, uh, that was, it took about a year. But since we're going chronological, let me say that, uh, you know, I was um, very depressed. I was suicidal. I was um, held in the forensic unit, which is a mental health uh, ward of the uh, of of the of of the county jail. Uh, you know, I uh, I did make a suicide attempt there. I tried to uh, hang myself with a blanket. I mean, I felt like my uh, life was over. Yeah. Uh, I got uh, bailed out after about uh, approximately thirty five days. Uh, you know, my uh, mother's boyfriend had owned a business, and he put the bail money up. But that became a big all every time I went to court, it was a big media. It was a big media moment, and uh, even the fact of him bailing me out became a news item, and his, his business suffered as as uh, as as well. It was that a big a deal? Uh, and uh, you know, when I was in the county jail waiting to get bailed out, you know, I, I thought I was going to be returning back to my old life. I would be going back to school, and I would be, be with my friends, and I would play and 
you know, everything that I normally did. And, you know, I, I realized that almost immediately once I came home that, you know, there was no going back to my life uh, ever. You know, I, I wasn't allowed to go back to the school while my case was pending. You know, the parents of my um, former friends wouldn't allow them to play with me. You know, even if that hadn't been the case, the majority of them didn't, didn't want anything to do with me anyway. I was a very hated figure in big skill because of the all because of the prejudicial pretrial media coverage, you know, which, you know, was um, facilitated by just reports that I had uh, confessed. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I really thought my I thought my life was over. And so I made another suicide attempt. I took a bottle of um, extra strength Tylenol and went to sleep. I tended not to wake up anymore. You know, I did, I did wake up, they probably rushed me to the hospital, they pumped my stomach, and, you know, I was um, involuntarily committed because of that for about uh, six months. And eventually, uh, eventually I got out from there and I went to live with my aunt and uncle for a few months. And uh, about, all told, it took maybe eight to ten months between the time I was arrested and when I went to trial. So along the way, uh, just talking with my mother, my grandmother, members of my extended family, you know, they changed my attitude and they had me believing in the system and they, you know, being confident that I was going to be found not guilty since I was innocent, you know, and so, uh, you know, heading into the trial, you know, I, I thought that I was uh, going to win. I had never heard of anything called a wrongful conviction. Jeff, that's so, so heartbreaking to hear about the the effect that it had on your mental health to drive you to want to take your own life. But at the same time, not surprising. How is a 16 year old supposed to deal with that mentally? It must have just been absolute uh, torture. And and thank God you're you're still here to, today to to tell the story. Um, and so, and so it came to your your trial where it seems that luck wasn't going your way there either. I mean, I did some research on your story and your your defense attorney was was pretty inept. Um the the medical examiner was was pressured to commit perjury, I think if I if I read uh correctly. Um and we also had a jury service that rushed to give a verdict because they wanted to get home for the Christmas holidays. I mean, you just you couldn't write this stuff. It's um it's it's just horrendous what happened to you if you could just walk us through that trial process in in your own words jeff sure sure and by the way you got everything exactly right by the way did yeah. the research well I, I, clearly clearly yeah. <laughs> i spent a yeah. lot of time absolutely yes so uh before the trial started the dna test came from the fbi lab which showed that semen and the victim didn't match me uh that's when the prosecutor got the medical examiner commit fraud commit perjury so uh, he claimed six months after doing the autopsy on the victim that he suddenly claimed, uh, oh, I, I remember that I forgot to document medical evidence to show that the victim had been sleeping around. So, wow. that, uh, yeah, so that allowed the prosecutor to argue that it didn't matter that the DNA didn't come for me. That didn't mean I was innocent. It, it simply was yet another person that she had slept with before I had murdered and raped her. And the whole key to this whole lie is that the victim's family had not been coming to court. So they had no idea of what was being said about her in, in the courtroom, that they were trashing her reputation because they were fabricating things. And this was a 15-year-old girl that was living a very sheltered life as well, wasn't she? Exactly right. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So taking it a step further, they mentioned another youth by name that they claimed and had been slept with the victim, but he never got a DNA, the prosecutor never got a DNA test performed uh, from him. He never called him as a witness. He didn't even try to support that. He just argued by inference with no evidence, which, you know, is, is actually misconduct to, uh, to, to, to do that. You know, speaking of the DNA test results, you know, one day before officially getting them from the FBI lab, he suddenly rushes to the grand jury to indict me. Uh, this way he could avoid presenting that evidence um, you know, then they got the medical examiner to commit the fraud. Uh, the medical examiner had been complained of in neighboring counties by law enforcement there. So he was moonlighting as a defense expert. So whichever way the money flowed is where he was giving, you know, fabricated testimony rather than just ground level truth being objective. Yeah. I mean, Jeff, at, at, at this stage, I've got to ask you, you something, really, because in anybody's eyes, I mean, you don't have to be a prosecutor or a police officer to, you know, find that DNA evidence, it not match you and think, 
well, we at least better investigate this further. They didn't do that. They went full speed ahead and went the other way. And so I have to ask you there, what do you think, looking back now, their intentions genuinely were? Do you think they they genuinely thought we have the right guy and we're bending sort of the rules a little bit just to get just to get the right guy? Or do you think they they knew it was pretty flawed and there was a chance they were putting an innocent person away because that's just, that's so shocking to believe that people in a position of power, like the police, the prosecutors would do something like that. But, you know, you having lived it, what is your honest opinion about what their intention and feeling, you know, intentions and feelings were at that time? I think that, I think it started off, they felt, they thought that I was guilty and they were just bending the rules a bit to get me. But but I think that that changed once the DNA didn't match me. And here's why I say that it is because when the DNA didn't match me, the police went back out into the field and they interviewed 17 witnesses who knew the victim in one capacity or another. And all of them told the police that she didn't have any boyfriend and she wasn't sexually active. The police purposely did not um, document any of those witness interviews like they were supposed to. And so therefore the defense never learned about that so there's that part of it uh, another thing is when they came to court they left the threat and false promise out of their testimony because those were illegal things that they did and they were willing to commit another crime with perjury by leaving that out of their story in addition not being content to have coerced the false confession out of me they also fabricated a statement they claimed, and this is again, only after the DNA doesn't match me, suddenly their reports about the interrogation they include an extra sentence that the earlier reports didn't. They suddenly claim that I told them, oh, I didn't know if the perpetrator ejaculated or not. And that word wasn't in my vocabulary as, as a 16 year old. And uh, it seems clear that they concocted that specifically to help the prosecutor get around the dna so at that point i feel like you know from all the sum total of all those things i feel like they they were just just trying to frame me at that point um i do want to turn to the deficiencies uh, of my defense attorney absolutely yeah so he never interviewed or called as a witness my uh, alibi was actually playing with the ball with the crime uh when the crime happened he never explained to the jury what the dna not matching me what what that explain what the significance of that was. He never used that result to challenge the confession. He never, he literally never cross-examined the medical examiner to expose his fraud. He should have never represented me because this other youth that the prosecutor was falsely saying had slept with the victim was represented by another member of um, Westchester County Legal League and specifically by the lawyer who was supposed to be supervising him on my case. So that conflict prevented the defense from asking him to give a DNA sample. It prevented the defense from calling him uh, as, a, as a witness. When I hadn't decided if I was going to testify, when I hadn't decided if I was going to have a jury trial or not, uh, my lawyer came to me one day and told me that the judge came to him off the record and told him to pick a jury because he didn't want to be responsible for finding me not guilty. So my lawyer was supposed to put that on the record. It was improper for him to limit my decision. It suggests that there's bias, that he's feeling public pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, you know, my interrogation was not videotaped or audio tape with no signed confession. So as I mentioned, they left the threat and false promise out. So I wanted to testify at the pre-trial hearing, but he wouldn't allow me to. And then when I got to the trial, uh, I wanted to testify there also. And he told me that it wasn't up to him to prove that uh, I, I was innocent. It was up to the prosecutor to prove that I was guilty. You know, he didn't think that that had happened. But yeah, that's very, that might be legal principle, but it, that's very naive to practice law like that because, you know, the, the general public don't believe that an innocent person would confess. So if you're defending a client in that kind of case, you have to answer that confession. You have to put your client on the stand, explain why they falsely confessed. You have to try to disprove as many different aspects uh, of the confession as you can and you bring it all together in your closing argument and argue the confession is uh, coerced and false, but he, he didn't do any of that. The last thing I'm going to mention is that, you know, the victim's clothes were admitted into evidence, including her bra. And the jury asked 
uh, to see the bra, which was important because uh, one of the statements in the coerced false confession was I said that I had ripped her bra off. So when they asked to see that, we thought that, well, they're thinking like we wanted to think. Some bras cannot be ripped off. And that was when the judge told us that the uh, clothing items had been left in the courtroom over the weekend and that the uh, apparently the custodians thought it was garbage. And so they threw it out. I mean, you just can't believe this series of, of events. You know, the tide was so against you, Jeff, and I'm imagining this happening and, you know, just seeing you so so helpless, really. I mean, nobody was helping you as they, they should have done. And um, very, you know, tragically, this led to you being wrongfully convicted and sentenced for this for this crime. Um, how long did the trial go on for before you were sentenced? And if you could also explain about the jury and, and their verdict. Yes. So the trial was, um, I think it was about a two week trial. You know, they deliberated for um, two and a half days. Uh, just before they reached the verdict, they sent a note out to the court asking would they be sequestered over the Christmas holiday if they didn't come up with a verdict. And uh, the judge said yes. You know, I later learned after I was exonerated that you know, one of the jur- jurors had contacted my lawyers and and um, he had said, you know, he, he had said that he was glad that I had been exonerated. He never thought that I was guilty. Mm-hmm. My lawyer said, well, then why did you vote that way? Why did you vote guilty? And he said, well, it was 11 to 1 at that point. I was the only holdout, you know, um, but uh, they were pressuring me. And then then uh, when we sent that that note that that they really a- amped up the pressure, we all wanted to go home for the Christmas holiday, and that was why I I switched my vote. Uh, wow. I, I couldn't. I remember when the jury came in the room. You know the the saying that I had heard at the county jail when the jury has reached the verdict. You know, look at them as they walk in the courtroom. If they look back at you and smile, that means they found you not guilty. But if they look away from you, if they look cold, if they look hard, then they've convicted you. And so I remember trying to make the eye contact and they were looking away and looking hard. And I remembered all of that. But then I'm thinking, nah, it can't, it can't be. I'm innocent. They couldn't have found me guilty. And uh, they read the verdict uh, out for the first three charges and I was found not guilty. And then, then suddenly guilty, guilty, guilty. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe my ears. I mean, I, I you know, I couldn't believe what I, what I was hearing. I even thought, did, did I just hear that right? I couldn't. My head was spinning, and I just, I, I just couldn't believe it. Did Did you say initially they read out not guilty and then guilty? Yes. Wow. Well, how How did that happen? What What happened there? Well, they had char- the prosecution had charged me with three different theories of murder, and so they, uh, the jury found me not guilty of uh, first degree murder and uh, uh, not guilty of a, a couple of uh, manslaughter charges that were connected to the first degree murder. So they found me not guilty of those, but then they found me um, guilty of felony murder, which is committing murder in the course of committing another felony. They found me guilty of rape. That was the other felony, and they found me guilty of um, depraved indifference murder, and they found me guilty of um, possession of a weapon. Wow. Wow. Um, Jeff, what's what's going through your mind at that stage? Um, is anything going through your mind? Can you process anything there? Or is it all just so shocking that you're frozen? Could, could you try and walk us through how you felt? Yeah, it was all so shocking that I was uh, that I was frozen. I mean, I remember that you know, my uh, mother and grandmother, you know, asked the court officer if they could sit in, in the chair next to me because, the, you know, the, the judge, my lawyer, the judge and the prosecutor got up to go in the judge's chambers to take care of some preliminary matter right right after that. And they had asked if I, they could sit next to me. They saw that I was, you know, in shock. You know, and then, of course, the, you know, the judge, the judge didn't, uh, did, did, didn't allow that. And, and they came back in the room and, and then, um, uh, the court clerk asked each individual juror. He went, you know, juror number one is uh, is uh, is your verdict guilty or not guilty? Guilty. And juror number two is your verdict guilty or not guilty? You know, guilty. And they went all down the line, all twelve of them. And I couldn't, I uh, I couldn't believe it. And so I'm taken back to to the to the county jail now. Wow. And um, another shocking thing about this. So we were you tried as as an adult at the age of sixteen or seventeen? Yeah. I was an adult, and therefore, you know, I, I was, you know, I was sentenced as an adult. So, I mean, the day of sentencing, I um, begged the judge to overturn the verdict because I was innocent, and I referenced the DNA, 
and he told me on the record, he said, you know, maybe, maybe you are uh, innocent, which is kind of a shocking thing for him to say, because if he thought that, then as a judge, he was supposed to overturn the verdict. I mean, he could have done that by reversing any number of rulings he made against me. And it just gave me the 15 to life sentence, which is an adult sentence if I had been charged as an adult. And I was ultimately sent to Elmira Correctional Facility, which is a prison for adults. Wow. So getting 15 to life for a crime you didn't commit at the age of, so you were 17 when you, when you were convicted, but 16 when it first happened. Yeah. And um, that's just, it's shocking. And I, 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 I might be wrong in saying, but I think I'm right that here in the UK, you certainly wouldn't be tried as an adult, that you'd be tried as a, as a juvenile and the situation would be totally different. Is that the same across the whole of the US or, or is it in different states? They have different laws. How does that work? Well, I mean, well, in general, laws are different in different states in, in the U.S., but in terms of, you know, charging people as as, as an adult, that, that's generally a, a across the board. I mean, New York just changed the law um, in the last couple of years. They, they moved the age up to 18, but that is that possibility is, is true across the board. And I really think it's unfair because, you know, for one thing, I mean, as the U.S. Supreme Court is, has acknowledged, you know, the brains are not fully developed and people that are younger, they're more spontaneous, they, they're not thinking long term the more susceptible to, to, to peer pressure and so for a whole host of reasons you know i don't i don't think that that's uh, i don't think that that's fair i mean an adult a completely cognizant healthy 30 year old for example you know committing the same crime as somebody 16 17 18 19 20 i don't think you could hold them at the, at, as being the the same the same thing absolutely not yeah absolutely and so you you were taken back to jail but this time for you know an incredibly long stint potentially life which must have been terrifying um and i've also heard you say before that you know prison was not a nice place to be i think it's fair to say you know there were slashings stabbings fights not involving weapons the food was terrible um and also i imagine when you first go in there are things like you know gangs and you've got to know who to talk to who not to talk to how to behave it sounds like a minefield i think is the best way i can imagine it whichever way you step or whichever which, whatever you do inevitably you're going to come into a problem could you just try and paint a picture for us uh, jeff of how how what prison was like and yeah how it was for you exactly but exactly what uh, exactly what you mentioned i mean i would say i would describe it as a you know non-stop obstacle course a minefield you know with the guards prisoners and, and civilians as as obstacles to trying to you know, regain the main focus, which is to overturn the conviction and regain your freedom. You know, um, there it was very extremely violent there, as you as you mentioned. There was stabbings or cuttings three or four every day. Other violence that didn't involve weapons. There was gangs. You know, over the years, I was uh, I was beat up, and at one time I nearly lost my life. You know, I had the bullseye on my back because I had been convicted of uh, sex offense. You know, rape with the with the murder, and there's a vigilante mentality was people have been convicted of sex offenses could you talk to us about that that incident i believe it was with weight plates or something it sounded horrific if you could just walk us through that if you don't mind sure i was hit multiple times on the side of my head by 10 pound weight plates by people who had thought that i was uh, thought that i was a rapist and then you know i went to it was so bad i went to the outside hospital and uh, doctors there told the correctional officials i was supposed to be put in the prison hospital for observation and instead, they they threw me in the hole with no observation at all. I mean, I I could have you know I could have died uh, from from that. So that was uh, a part of that. But beyond the physicality, you know, there was um, it was also mental. I mean, I had to uh, overcome thoughts of um, uh, helplessness, hopelessness, thoughts of giving up, uh, suicidal ideation that that came came to my mind uh, a lot. Uh, I did lose seven appeals, and every time I lost one, you know, uh, it's hard. It's hard to have an appeal and hard to hope, and you know, and not get your hopes up and expect that you're you're gonna you're gonna win because I knew I was innocent, and I naively thought the court system got more accurate as it um, went up higher. But you know, I lost like seven appeals, and you know that that was all uh, that was all very uh, crushing and. You know, um, and it, when I was beat up at times, and you know, I wasn't just the physicality of that either. I mean, then as punishment, because I tried to fight back the best that I that I could, you know, I was kept in the cell 23 hours a day. You know, they send less food. The food was three or four days old. 
you know, take two showers one week, three the next, instead of being able to shower every day as the rest of the population, and you, you can't use the farm while you're on on that that status. So it was it was a hellhole. It was a nightmare, and you know, half the time I couldn't really believe that I was there because the odds of any one of those things happening that led to my being wrongfully in prison, the odds of all of those seemed very long, much less to be cumulatively. I don't just one thing that I want to just. Uh, digress for a half second. I, I remember when I arrived in Elmira and the guards asked me, you know, do you want to go to protective custody? And I said, well, you know, what, what's that? And they explained, well, when someone's in fear of their life, then, you know, we keep them in the cell 23 hours a day and that way they're safe and they come out for recreation, they'll be by themselves. But, you know, you can't, you're not going to recreation with anybody else that, that way. And, you know, there's no school or vocational trades, you, you know, you, 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 you making your condition worse. So I, I made, so at 17, I made a decision. You know, I, I said to myself, you know, I can't really believe I'm here, first of all. I'm here for something I didn't do, you know, and, uh, you know, I've got a life sentence. And, you know, I'm not going to make my situation worse. You know what? I'm going to population, and I'm going to take my chances. And if somebody kills me, well, then I guess I don't have to worry about doing the rest of that life sentence now, do I? And that was my line of reasoning at 17. Wow, that's um, that is heartbreaking, uh, Jeff. It is, it is really, really heartbreaking, and it sounds like um, hell on earth. I wouldn't wish you know anyone to 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 have to go through that. But I actually think I think you're an incredibly tough and resilient um, person, Jeff. How how did you get through those sixteen years in in those conditions, knowing on top of you know the the all of the things that were that were terrible in prison knowing that you hadn't committed the crime what what keeps you going what you know when you have an appeal that's that's turned down is is there a mental mindset that you eventually adopt that's kind of like survival mode are there activities that that you do that help to keep you going was it people that you met what what got you through that jeff all of those things so belief in god was one thing the next thing was you know, uh, I, I just told myself, you know, I'm not doing this life sentence. I'm I'm just doing a year or two to for the next appeal. So I just got to make it between now and then. You know, and I'm sure I'm going to win. And so every time I would lose, it would be it would be crushing, it would be demoralizing. But at the same time, you know, within a few days, I get up and I metaphorically dust myself off and I refocus on the next appeal. So I did that. Uh, so I kind of lived from appeal to appeal. Uh, aside from that, I found uh, I found things to throw myself into. So I took uh, educational programs that I thought had some kind of potential value for me in the event that I was released. So I got GED. I learned to type. I, I took computer class. Uh, I got associate's degree. I got a year towards a bachelor before the funding was cut. Uh, I learned how to tutor adults. I worked as a teacher's aide. I went into food service. Um, I went to the law library and learned the law that gave a feeling of comfort and like I was fighting back wow. uh, and I didn't trust lawyers to defend me anymore either. So I better no. learn the law to be able to understand what's going on and give suggestions. Uh, I used to collect uh, articles of other people who were exonerated and, uh, you know, that was uh, that was uh, motivation. Uh, I used to listen to sports talk radio, but it wasn't listening to sports talk radio. It was like a lifeline to the outside. Uh, yeah. When I was at recreation, I you know, I used to play basketball and ping pong and I would play chess. But I, and I had this, I needed to leave the prison for a few hours mentally. So I engaged in this elaborate delusion, like I was a professional player and so was everyone else. And, you know, and, uh, you know but it wasn't like kids though, you know, it was, I needed, it was a defense mechanism. It was much, uh, it was much uh, deep, deeper than that. And even I used to cut out pictures of uh, uh, nature scenes. There was like a square box area on the cell wall and you were allowed to put pictures up if you, if you wanted and so you know i used to put pictures up of nature scenes and i would sleep in such a way that the first thing that i woke up i could take in one of those nature scenes you know i, I i'll i'll hear the i'll hear the damn keys and the boots of the guards and see the cell bar i'll, I'll get to all that horrific horrificness uh, i'll get to that soon enough right let me just let the first thing be something nice before all that craziness sets in i gotta keep going with this craziness in here. So, you know, I mean, so that was how, but I also, I knew no one was coming to my rescue. And so I had to, no choice but to hold it together to try to recruit somebody that I didn't know already that would like help build the bridge between me and the 
investigative and legal help. So I knew if I lost my mind, the odds of that happening were, were almost not, not existing. So I didn't have the luxury of uh, doing that. And uh, what I want to mention is that after I was, uh, you know, my appeals were over after 11 years. I wrote letters for four years looking for someone to represent me for free to find some new evidence without which I couldn't get back into court. Then I went to the parole board. Uh, I got turned down for parole largely because I uh, maintained my innocence. And I was pretty much at the end of my rope. Uh, but two important things happened. So first of all, uh, a, a ad that I placed in a newspaper looking for a pen pal, somebody answered the letter. And but uh, last year they, they were my pen pal. And like I was openly asking him in those letters, look, you think I should keep going with this? Should I keep fighting? Do I just give up? Maybe I should just commit suicide. And I, I repeatedly asked him that. And so he, he kept me going morale wise. But then also one of the letters that I uh, wrote looking for help it, uh, sending to the publishing company, someone there uh, sent the letter to an investigator and she believed in my innocence once she saw the paperwork for the DNA did it, did it match me and she suggested I write the Innocence Project again. She lobbied them outside the organization to take my case. She got other respected legal entities to lobby them. I got lucky that one of the case intake workers presented my case three times to the lawyers, you know, not accepting no the first two times and she got them to, to take it. So all of those spookish things happened in order for me to get their representation. That was the key, getting representation. Second thing is the district attorney who had um, blocked me from getting further DNA testing for all of my appeals. She left office. The uh, third thing is that we got lucky that the actual perpetrator, uh, he, um, he, when we put the DNA into the data bank, you know, it matched him because he had killed the second victim three and a half later who had a pair of children and that was how his DNA came to be in the data bank so when I got the testing it uh, it matched him and so from all those things the conviction was overturned I was released September 22nd 2006 and I reported back to court um, November 2nd 2006 at which point all the charges were dismissed against me on uh, actual innocence grounds whereas he was arrested and convicted of crime. Wow. Wow. I mean, so much to process there. And one, you know, sort of salt to the wound uh, fact there is, is not only did they get the wrong person, but on top of that, the real perpetrator went on to commit actually more murders after, after you were wrongfully convicted, which, you know, it's just, um, that is, is just terrible. Well, thankfully you finally had, you know, the tide going, going your way and, um, fantastic that you had that pen pal and you came across the innocence project and they agreed to take your case and that putting that DNA evidence through the, the system again, found the real, the real, uh, culprit. So thank, thank God that happened. But before we touch on how things were and how you felt coming out of there, there's another thing that I wanted to talk about, which must have been extremely difficult uh, when you were on the in inside during those 16 years, because friends and family that you had had, I imagine some of them probably did, did some of them disappear. Did any of them think you were guilty? And did that mean that you had less visits? And, and yeah, was that an added uh, difficult hurdle that you had to deal with? An additional added difficult hurdle was that I had very few visitors. I mean, I essentially did the time by myself. I mean, my mother came to see me. Uh, she believed in my innocence. Uh, my grandmother for a time came, then she passed away while I was there. Uh, I had several sets of aunts and uncles that they would come and disappear for three years, visit, disappear for another three years. So they did that a couple of times. And the rest of them, they, the rest of, uh, rest of my family never never came. I had a couple of friends. One friend came one time, another friend stayed in touch for about five years, and then he faded off. You know, the last um, last six years, you know, it was, um, I was lucky if I saw my mother once or, once or twice, once every uh, six months. And also nobody else was uh, coming to see me. Uh, my brother, who was three and a half years younger than me, uh, he came like three times in 16 years, not, not at all in the last, uh, in the last decade. So in a lot of ways, I you know did the time by myself, and that was an added hurdle because I mean this contact from the outside is really is, is essential. It's very hard to do to do time outside support. 
Absolutely, that's heartbreaking. And, and was that beca- partly because some people thought you might have been guilty? Were there people that knew you before that distanced themselves from you because of that? Well, I think I think friend, uh, former friends uh, did that. I mean, there was an uncle. There had one uncle in law enforcement, and, and you know, the, he spoke to the police, and they managed to convince him that he you know, was guilty. And so him and his daughter thought that I was guilty, but the rest of them claimed to have believed in my innocence, but that belief didn't translate into them assisting me. They, they, didn't, they didn't try to help me on the morale level. There were several times that my mother made rounds and was trying to get everybody to just contribute a manageable amount so that I could hire a lawyer, you know, and everybody declined, uh, declined to do that as well. Well, fast forwarding now to that, that incredible moment when, when you were exonerated, um, you know, a much needed break in your, in, in your fortune. How did you feel when you were in the courtroom and your conviction was, you know, was lifted and you were a free man? Can you put that into words? Yeah, sure. So I got up to leave and then kind of like the enormity of it uh, hit me, almost like a ton of bricks. And I sat back down. And, you know, I just my head was kind of spinning and my lawyers were speaking to me, but you know, like I was hearing their voices fading in and out. Uh, you know, and so I stood there for maybe like twenty minutes, half an hour, and then, you know, then I felt ready and I stood up and every step that I took towards the door when nobody stopped me, it got more and more real. I remember on my way out the door there was a there was a court officer standing by the door and she was trying to be professional and stoic, but you could see the water running, you know, in her eyes. I looked up for her. I made eye contact and I said, Thank you. You know, and she um and you know, she wished me uh good luck. I remember I stepped outside, I, I went went outside and I was just kind of bewildered, really. And uh, my, my first words at the press conference were, you know, is this is this really happening? I mean, I questioned whether it was all happening or did, did I finally manage to just lose my mind from all of this? Am I going to wake back up and I'm going to see the, you know, the prison bed, the bars and everything else? Yes. Yeah. God, well, I can imagine. Yeah, it's even hard to believe hard to accept that that finally this nightmare the nightmare was over um that must have been an incredible feeling and one which i think nobody unless they've been through it will ever be able to even remotely understand but you know not forgetting the fact though that you'd been away for 16 years and it was interesting that you went in when you were 16 or 17 so you'd been in prison the same amount of time that you'd lived outside of it and obviously the time that you'd been outside of it becomes you know a memory the world has changed a lot there are new technologies um that can't have been an easy transition for you jeff if you could tell us a bit about what it was like trying to get used to life on the outside yeah, it was very di- it was it was very difficult. I mean, I felt like I didn't belong out here. I mean, frankly, I mean it. Uh, you know, the cell phones, GPS, internet hadn't been created. Culture was different. Cities and towns looked uh, different. There was just enough things that looked the same as to make me feel like I was in an alternative universe. Uh, it was very lonely. I, mean, I lost track of friends and family, as we we've talked about um, talked about before. Um, you know, there are. The psychological after effects of being wrongfully imprisoned, um, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, panic attacks, anxiety, feeling of uh, processing things at a slower speed, or feeling having been frozen in time. When I was released, and I was 32. The last time I had been free was 17, so I felt like I was uh, I felt like I was uh, 17. You know, so that part of it was difficult. Um, uh, just having never been, never having had a driver's license, never having lived alone, or, or Wrote a check or balance the budget. I mean, all those things were uh, made made the transition particularly difficult for me. There was a stigma attached. I mean, no one really questioned my innocence, but it was more that uh, you were in prison for 16 years wrongfully. Uh, yeah, but you were there for 16 years. So how much of that rubbed off on you? Is it you know safe to be alone someplace uh, with you? Uh, I was always passed over for for uh, various jobs that I, that I uh, applied applied for so it was a very difficult um first five years absolutely absolutely we had to be incredibly resilient again to to get through that 
Um, it can't have been an easy, easy process. And I can imagine that there would have been some mental trauma from that. You know, no, no 16 year old should have to go through that. And, um, you know, it's no surprise that, that that you had some some issues with that after. Is, is, is that something which you have to continually work on with a with a therapist or, or psychologist even to this day to try and come to terms with it or? Yeah, I still feel, I mean, I did go to, I, I, for about six years, I went to see mental health professionals for, you know, four hours a, a week. I did that for six years. Um, you know, I, uh, I would say that, I would say that I'm a lot more grounded now. I'll overcome a lot of the after effects, but at the same time, you know, I still do feel some of the, uh, some of the after effects now. So some of it still, uh, still affects me. I mean, I'm not seeing a mental health professional right now, but that's because, you know, I felt like I had gone as far as I could, and really there weren't any people that this is, they're not used to treating people that have post traumatic stress disorder um, from having been wrongfully in, in, in prison. So there's not a lot of people who are, who are able to, um, able, 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 that have, have the experience to, to, to deal with it. Jeff, how long was it after you were released that you received um, compensation from, from the government for all the, you know, the terrible things that, that you had to go through as, as a result of their, of their actions? And also how much was that compensation? Yeah, it was, uh, it, it took five years. Um, they, New York State, they paid um, $1.85 million. Note that I said that they paid that. It's not, it's not what I got. You have to pay the expenses and the lawyers take a third. So in reality, as a litigant, you know, you, you keep 55 to 60 percent of, you know, what's, uh, what, was, what was paid. But at least that way, you know, uh, I knew I, I had some stability financially and I knew that, you know, I could pay my bills every, every month. And that took like a big mental strain off of me as well. Uh, that way, but I also filed. Um, I had filed a federal civil suit, and you know I had um, sued the city of Pisco because the police officer was fabricating the statement and coercing the confession out of me. Uh, I sued Westchester County. Uh, there was their medical examiner committed the fraud, so they settled. Um, the figures are public, so I'm fine to share. So they settled um, six point five million dollars. Pisco settled for five point three. I sued the Legal Aid Society for an amount I'm not allowed to disclose, and I went to trial against the polygraph in Putnam County, and um, the, the jury didn't realize that we had a, a deal in place going into that trial where if they if they lost, they would have to pay $10 million, and if uh, they won, they would just have to pay the six, so the jury didn't realize that. And uh, so they uh, came back with like a $41,161,000 verdict. Um, I don't regret doing the other deal because there's no way I would have gotten that money. I've thought about that and then done some legal research. So yeah, then it wouldn't have um, came out. But I, I look, I take it as an expression of their outrage in what uh, in what happened. Wow. Wow. So we're talking, you know, millions and millions of, of dollars here, which is totally life-changing money. And the thing that I find fascinating and incredible about your story, uh, Jeff, and I think it says an awful lot about your character is with that money, you could have gone and got the Florida mansion and um, put your feet up and tried to put it all behind, put the nightmare behind you. But but no, you've chosen to start the the Jeff Jeffrey Deskovic Found Foundation, um, which is gonna which helps uh, other people overturn wrongful convictions. And you've also studied to become a lawyer, um, and you've graduated, I believe. So you're on the way to to doing that. Why why do that, Jeff? Why return to um, an area, a topic that's caused you so much trauma um, when you clearly don't need to financially? I think it's an incredibly brave thing to do yeah why why do that well be, be, because I, well I, I believe that my mission my, my purpose in the world is to uh fight wrongful conviction uh that's that's part of it. it's how i make sense of everything in a kaleidoscopic type of way it's how i make sense of what happened to me you know uh, i need you know i need my suffering to account for something uh another thing is that i feel like i've had educational opportunities that other people haven't had and so i'll you know, I feel like a, I feel a large, a, a lot of uh, moral responsibility to do do everything that I that I can. I think it would be a wasted opportunity for me not to use the platform that I, I have to do this type of work. You know, the foundation has been able to get uh, eight, eight people uh, home that have been wrongfully imprisoned. Eight people home that have been wrongfully imprisoned. Yes, we've had to get eight people home. Another person's coming home uh, the, the end of the month, God willing. So 
that'll be nine. We've been able to pass three laws, uh, videotaping interrogations and identification procedures and uh, better, you know, better deep procedures and DNA database expansion. Uh, I'm an advisory board member of a coalition called It Could Happen to You, and the foundation is part of that. And we've been able to pass uh, four additional laws, uh, uh, oversight board for prosecutors uh, and uh, sharing information by both sides so that the defense can have access to the evidence also, you know, so the prosecution having a, having a leg up. We just passed a law in Pennsylvania that uh, would expunge everybody's record you know, if they've been charged, arrested for something, and then they, if they ultimately win their case, it's dismissed, or however it is that they win, that it, you know, they, their record gets expunged. So I've uh, done that and uh, also um, sit on the Global Advisory Council for Restorative Justice International, and I'm their in house advisor on wrongful conviction and criminal justice issues, and they decide amongst themselves what position they're going to take on different issues. I, give them my input, I tell them what I think and why, and they take the info from there and decide what they're gonna do. But, you know, I, I find it all, I find it very healing. Uh, I find it cathartic, I find it meaningful. You know, um, I'm not an angry or bitter person. I wanna enjoy my life as much as I can, and I can't do that if I'm angry or bitter. And the, the device that allows me to do that is I take the energy that I would feel and I channel it into the uh, advocacy work are you a qualified lawyer now? You you represent people? I am, yes. I graduated law school. Yes. So at some point, I became not content with sitting in the front row in the courtroom. I wanted to be able to sit at the defense table and represent some of the clients, uh, my, you know, my, my, myself. And I do have a master's degree. My master's thesis was written on lawful conviction clause and reform. But I did get to that point, as I mentioned, I wanted to do more than just sit in the front row in the courtroom. So uh, May 2019, I did graduate Pace Law School, and I, um, as of October 26th, I'm admitted to the bar. So I'm officially, uh, I'm officially an attorney now. And so the dream is to be able to, you know, exonerate um, uh, others as, as as an attorney. Jeff, you are you are an absolute uh, inspiration. You really are to have gone through what the terrible things that you had to go through as a as a child, effectively, um, sixteen years of indescribable pain, and um, to now you know finally getting out, getting that exoneration, getting all of that compensation, and and choosing to put it into you know trying to help people that sadly have to go through similar situations to the ones um you had to go through i just i i, I think that's that's incredible and um, and jeff one way that i like to finish off my my podcast is by by getting guests to give listeners um a couple of bits of advice based on their experience if if they might find themselves going through um you know tough times uh, i think there are very few people listening that would that would have to go through the the the, the torture that that you did but there will be people listening that you know are, are not having an easy ride at, at the moment and um yeah do you have anything that you could share that you know might help others get through the, the hard times 100 percent, definitely let, let me say just before i get to that you know my um there is a uh, documentary short about me called conviction which is available on uh, amazon prime if people would like to uh, to uh to uh watch that and you know i do have a public figure page on facebook jeffrey deskovic and if people want to keep up with my advocacy work and interviews, upcoming events, et cetera, uh, that, and learn more about wrongful conviction and justice reform, I post a lot of articles and things, even ones that don't pertain to me, but are just in the general area. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about those things, please um, just go, like my public figure page. Uh, in terms of general advice to um, listeners, um, I would say that, look, just never give up. Uh, I, I chase dreams set goals, come up with a realistic plan for getting there, carry out that plan, be flexible enough to, you know, uh, remember the route, the route or the plan is not the goal. The goal is the goal. So while you might follow the plan, if it becomes clear, you have to alter the route a little bit to get to the goal, be flexible enough to do that. Uh, just don't take no for an answer. Don't be afraid to work hard. Um, there are there are no excuses. There might be reasons why something is more difficult to accomplish, but there are no excuses. And if you want it enough and you're willing to work hard enough and don't and just don't quit, you can get there. So those are all things that I think your listeners can apply. One thing that I told myself while I was in prison at times and I was teetering on the idea of giving up and you know, even in that five year period before I got any compensation or 
any number of junctures in law school where it was just, you know, too difficult, you know, to keep going and even studying for the bar, those 10, 14 hour days that, you know, happen for like two and a half months before you take the bar. Uh, this following mental mindset or, or thought, however you want to phrase it, I, I acted on, which was, you know, if I quit right now, maybe, maybe this was, uh, maybe I was about to have a breakthrough. Maybe that was that watershed moment. But you know, but because I quit, I didn't break through. So I, I'm too afraid to stop because this might have been the moment. So I'm going to keep plowing ahead and just to see, you know, what will, what, what was, what would have happened on the other side. And I just bury my head down and just keep going using, using that device. So I would, I would say that encourage that for the listeners. You know, I, I appreciate small things. I, I like to feel the sun on my face, fresh air, you know, freedom of, uh, of movement. So I would say appreciate the small things, try to, you know, take advantage of each, uh, each moment. A lot of people, myself included, we, we really don't think about those, um, you know, those, 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 those small things. And, you know, if you look at people that are in, in a worse position than you, I mean, it can, it can re, reframe the context that you look at your, your, your difficulties, whatever those might be. And, and it makes it a little bit more uh, manageable. So I would encourage people to, to do that. And if you have gone through and overcome one traumatic thing or another, when you do break through and you overcome, you know, you're on the other side and you, know, you got to reach back. You got to reach back for other people that are in, in the same position that, that you are in and, and find a way to make a difference um, uh, for them and work on that issue uh, o- overall. And it doesn't have to be one for conviction. It could be something totally unrelated, but reach back for the other people going through the struggle that you yourself went through and managed to come out the other side. Wow. Wow, Jeff. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm almost lost for words after hearing this Um this entire story and you giving such practical and useful bits of advice there, which, which anyone can apply to their own life. They don't have to have, you know, had a wrongful conviction. It was, it was very, um, yeah, very practical. Anybody can find that stuff useful. Um, and especially coming from you having, having gone through, you know, the real definition of extreme adversity. I just think you're an absolute inspiration. You're doing fantastic work now to bring other people home that were also wrongfully convicted and, um, yeah the the sky is the limit jeff and i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to to speak to you and i wish you all the best with your your journey going forward thank you very much and thanks for having me on it was a, it was a pleasure to do the uh to 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 do this uh in, do the interview that's it for today's episode guys if you liked it give it a thumbs up and if you want to see more make sure you subscribe and above all thanks a lot for watching if you've got a story that you want to share on the back and track podcast get in touch, give me a shout. I'd love to hear from you via info at backontrackpodcast.com.